Hi guys, my name's Eloise. Uh, welcome to my YouTube channel. Um, I'm going to sit down today to do a Q&A video all about PhDs, their application process, what it's like to do one. Um, so let's get straight into it. First of all, a little bit about me. Um, my name's Eloise. Um, I'm just about to start my third year as a PhD student at Imperial College London in applied maths slash theoretical physics. Um, I'm 24 and I'm originally from Scotland, but now I live in London for my PhD. So before my PhD, I actually studied at the University of Edinburgh, where I completed an integrated master's degree, which basically means that it was an undergraduate and master's programme combined into one. Um, and that was in the subject of mathematics. Um, but yeah, towards the end of that degree, I definitely specialised more in the applied side of maths. I thought this Q&A was quite well timed um, because tomorrow is actually the first day of term um, at Imperial. So it's sort of time of year that uh, new people are coming and um, prospective PhD students might be thinking about starting to apply for next year. Um, so I thought I'd just go ahead and answer some questions. I've taken some of these from YouTube comments or just generally what people usually ask me about PhDs and some common questions and misconceptions on the internet. Just a little disclaimer before we start, I do a STEM PhD in the UK university um, and obviously I don't know as much about other university PhD processes abroad so a lot of the advice and the answers will be general but some of the things about like application processes and how the PhD works will be more specific to UK STEM PhDs. Okay, the first question is why should you do a PhD and then also why did I end up doing a PhD? So this is a great question to ask yourself because it's not a small undertaking to start a PhD. So in the UK, PhDs are usually about three and a half to four years long. Um, I think in the US they can be even longer, like five to six years long. So it's good to sit down and think why the reasons why you should go into a PhD program um, and not just to do it to um, delay deciding what to do with your life although that is one of the reasons I ended up doing a PhD um, but you should do a PhD if you enjoy really digging into a research topic um, if you want to still consider pursuing a career in academia you have to do a PhD Another reason personally I enjoy doing my PhD um, is the flexible lifestyle. Um, it tends to be um, quite free and independent compared to people just starting in a job in a company. Um, at least in my PhD it's very flexible um, and I enjoy being able to split my time how I like and um, being quite independent in those respects. And although I would say that you're signing up for quite a long time, um, this time does go quite quickly and it's not such a long time in terms of research timelines, like papers usually take at least one to two years to develop. So I wouldn't worry about it taking up like all of your young adult life. Another great reason to do a PhD is to continue developing um, other skills. Some jobs in industry sometimes do require a PhD or um, might prefer uh, people to have a PhD, for example, uh, research and development jobs or even some careers in finance might require you to do a PhD. So you kind of have to weigh up the pros and cons for yourself. A PhD is not for everyone, um, but yeah, I don't regret doing a PhD, um, even if I don't necessarily end up in an academic career. So how do you find and choose a PhD once you've actually decided to do one? Um, so there are a few different routes in the UK. Either you can do what I did, which is um, you find a supervisor um, and a research area with them and just apply directly to the university um, and you find funding with that university and that's how you um, go through your PhD and you're straight into your independent research project immediately. The other route that's common in um, STEM universities in the UK is something called a CDT, which stands for a Centre of Doctoral Training, or sometimes they're called DTPs, Doctoral Training Programmes. Um, and these are usually programmes that are a kind of around a, a broad subject area. For example, um, there's one in uh, Imperial called um, Stats 
and machine learning. So it's all around statistics and machine learning and AI and those kind of things. Um, and that's a program that you would apply to without having a direct supervisor in mind usually. And how that works is for the first semester or the first year, you might have a few courses to attend to broaden your knowledge in that area and deepen it. And then you would go into some mini research projects and rotations with a few different supervisors to test out um, those different areas before ultimately deciding on one of them as your main PhD research project. So you'll actually only start on that um, around six to 12 months in and then spend the rest of the time doing that. Um, I actually ended up being quite lucky in how I found my PhD in that I did a summer research project the summer before um, at Imperial and I really enjoyed the subject area that I was doing and I enjoyed my supervisor so that allowed me to directly just um, apply there and start in that research area but I think if I hadn't found that I really would have considered doing a CDT instead just to um, get to know the people at the university and see who I worked well with and to explore a subject area and decide what I liked within it and in terms of if you haven't um, tried a research project with someone. How other ways that you can find um, a supervisor is either through sites like I think it's called findaphd.com in the UK and you can scroll through there just to get an idea or even um, to apply to certain projects that have already been put forward by a supervisor. The other way is just going straight to university websites looking through subject areas that you're interested in and looking at the academics. They'll often say on their website if they're open to new PhD students and literally to send them an email. I even emailed a few potential supervisors before I started at some other institutions and just asked if I could set up a Zoom call with them and ask about what their research was like and their uh, research group. So I would recommend doing that and they'll know a lot more about the application process for their particular university and so on. Another great way to find a PhD is actually by talking to your lecturers in courses that you really enjoy. Um, this might help you if you want to stay at the same university that you did your undergrad or masters um, because they may have um, PhD positions available and that really helps because you already know the lecturer um, and you know whether you might enjoy working with them or not. Um, otherwise, it's a great way to ask them if they know any other friends or um, connections in any other universities in a similar research area and they may be able to put you in contact. So a bit of academic networking like this can really go a long way um, and they could even recommend you if you, they know that you're a good student. So that's another great way that I would recommend to go about finding PhDs and supervisors. That brings us on nicely to the application process um, for a PhD and also the funding. That's kind of a question tied to that. So unlike when you apply for an undergraduate degree at um, a UK university through UCAS, um, the PhD application process can be very different depending on the university that you apply to. So that's why I recommend reaching out to the supervisor beforehand and they might be able to give you a few bits of advice about the application process. But usually it'll involve sending some kind of academic CV and maybe um, a personal statement about your experiences. And occasionally um, you might be asked to write a short research proposal, but usually this isn't something that's required in a lot of depth or you might be able to do it with your potential supervisor as just a sort of vague idea of what might happen in the PhD. Once you've actually applied for a PhD, you'll often hear back um, within a few months um, and they will often offer you an interview and these will likely be with the academics that you might work with in your area and they will ask you questions about previous research experiences and why you want to do a PhD and things like that and they'll often write up a report and that will ultimately help the university decide who to give places to and who to give funding to. Then in terms of funding, there are lots of different forms of funding. Often universities will have their own scholarships available that you can apply to in combination with your application to that university. And that's the way that I got my funding. Um, but sometimes there's also research grants specifically for a project that you might apply to, or sometimes a centre of doctoral training will have its own um, form of funding and that will be attached to that centre of 
doctoral training. Um, there are so many different routes, you just need to really look on the internet. Uh, the final route is um, self-funding students, so you might have some money saved up or have some other form of income somewhere, so you wouldn't get paid and often there are some small tuition fees that you have to give the university. Um, so that's a much harder route and I would only recommend that for people if you actually have that income available, not to work a full-time job alongside your PhD, that's not going to really work. Then the next question is actually how much do PhD students actually get paid when you get given this funding? And again, the answer is this depends. Um, I think the minimum values um, for a PhD stipend are um, updated every year. Um, this is listed on the UKRI's website. So the minimum um, scholarship stipend outside London um, this coming academic year is £19,200 a year or so. And then inside London, like where I live, because the cost of living is a lot higher inside London, um, that's £21,200 a year. And that's something called a tax-free stipend, which means that that is actually the amount you receive, whereas with a normal job salary, say £30,000 a year, that is then going to be taxed, so your take-home pay is actually going to be less. But with um, a PhD stipend, this is the amount you actually get per year, and that does not count towards your tax allowance, so you can do other kinds of small bits of work alongside that um, before you're actually going to be taxed. Um, for example, some teaching jobs within the university um, can supplement that income. And then that's the minimum amount. And then occasionally there are funding opportunities that might be slightly higher than the minimum. You just have to find these and apply, but be aware that these may be more competitive. One stereotype about PhD students is that they don't get a lot of money. Um, and I would say that the stereotype is actually true. Like the minimum stipend, it's enough to live on, I would definitely say, um, especially if you're good with money, it's definitely possible to um, be able to be financially independent, like I am. If you're being careful with your money, you're not just living a luxury lifestyle, it's definitely possible to pay rent, pay your needs, pay some personal allowance to yourself and buy nice things and also save a little bit of money. But again, uh, you have to be aware that you are signing up for three or four years on not being on a lot of pay. You're not going to be um, necessarily saving a lot of money. But yeah, I, I would say that it's been plenty for me to live on. And what a lot of PhD students do is to do teaching work um, in their university. When you're an undergraduate in the university, often a lot of your teaching assistants in classes are PhD students and they're being paid for that work alongside their studies. Um, and so that's a good way to supplement your income and also just taking some marking duties within the university. How much do PhD students work? Okay, so this is a question I think that a lot of people ask themselves online um, because there is this um, stereotype that PhD students are in the lab for 16 hours a day on not very much money um, and just being over completely overworked. I guess in some cases this could be true, but in my personal experience, in my PhD, um, I tend to work a kind of standard week of around 35 to 40 hours per week, um, Monday to Friday schedule and not working deep into the night, usually. And so, uh, yeah, I find that I am quite strict with this work-life balance. And as everyone says, um, a PhD is more of a marathon than a sprint and so um, I make sure to pace myself and just kind of keep up this full-time job attitude to a PhD without being completely overworked and that really works for me. Again this depends on your PhD because I do a, a very computational PhD so I can just work wherever my laptop is but some PhD students in STEM might have um, lab and experiments to do um, and they might not be completely in control of what time they are going to happen and so sometimes those students might have to work a bit more one week or work at the weekend. At least in my area of maths, theoretical physics, um, this seems to be quite standard of how much people work per week and it's definitely manageable to have that and also have plenty of hobbies outside of your PhD. And I think it's healthy to have lots of things outside of your PhD so that it's not just this one thing that you're obsessed with, as with any job. Another question is, do PhD students take holiday? 
The short answer is yes. PhD students don't work all the time and can take holidays. At least in my university, um, I think they recommend that PhD students um, are allowed to take about the same as academics and staff in the university, which is 25 holidays, which are free choice, um, and then around 14 or 15 college closure days, which are things like Christmas Day and bank holidays and a few other days like that. Though one of the differences um, with holidays in your PhD um, versus being a student in an undergrad programme is that you get to pick your holidays freely, a bit like in a job. Um, you don't get your whole summer um, holiday off in this big chunk. You get to decide when to take that holiday. The other great thing about um, PhDs is that you can often travel to a lot of conferences and this is working while also travelling. So you're not necessarily taking any holiday leave, um, but you're still getting to travel the world and often you're not paying it because as part of your funding, you often get some travel expenses to attend conferences and workshops and seminars and stuff like that. And what you can actually often do is take a few days um, before or after a conference to take some holiday in that location. And then you've not played for your flight or train to get there, um, but you can still spend some time enjoying and sightseeing um, a new part of the world. I've been lucky to go to Paris, Berlin, um, and I even went to India last year, which was really cool. One question someone asked was to talk um, a bit more about my research area. Um, so it's true, I've vlogged um, some of my work, but I've not really talked too much in detail about what my research area is and what my PhD is all about. Um, so I sort of usually tell people it's in applied maths, theoretical biophysics, um, but that covers a lot of subject areas. That's basically because it is quite interdisciplinary. My research area is called active matter. And basically we look at models that are inspired from biology. So these could be things like systems of bacteria in nature um, to one that I'm looking at in particular is models of flocking behavior. So a bit like how birds fly in the sky or fish swarms uh, form in the sea. And I'm looking at how these systems of many random agents work together to actually produce um, patterns from this disordered behaviour. And I often look at this from a numerical perspective, which means that I simulate lots of these models on a computer and then analyse these. But sometimes we also look at the equations directly and try to say things about the physical behaviour from the equations and match this up to numerics. Um, and then sometimes this can even be matched up to experiments um, and we try to say things about biology and nature overall. Hopefully that gives you a little taste of what my research area is um, and if people are interested I could also make more of a whole video um, about what I've been doing over the past two years and where I think it is going. The next question is, are there any courses that you should take as an undergrad if you want to do a PhD in a certain area? My answer is none in particular. Um, it kind of depends on the situation. For example, if you really know what you want to do in your PhD, then obviously you should take some relevant courses for that. Um, but the main thing I would recommend is trying to make sure you get lots of uh, research experiences um, in your undergraduate years, um, whether that's in group projects or individual projects, as this will really give you a taste of what carrying out research is like. And it's really one of the best things to show on your application for a PhD. That's what universities are looking for is some research experience. The other thing I would add to that is even if your university doesn't offer that many research experiences, you can also look online for opportunities to carry out some research, either at your university or another institution over the summer or over um, a spring break or something like that. Um, and that will really show universities when you apply for a PhD that you are really motivated about research and that you are ready for carrying out research independently. Sort of tied into that question is, can you actually take any courses while you're doing a PhD? Um, the answer is yes, um, you usually can. Um, it's 
not completely compulsory in my PhD program. Um, usually when I need to learn something, I will learn this from other research papers or online resources or from others in my group or my supervisor because it's quite a niche area. But uh, I do have to take a minimum number of credits of these short graduate school courses. Um, they're just like a few hours long um, and they're in things from CV writing to scientific writing to more technical courses like beginner's Python um, or deep learning even. And I, I've actually found these courses quite useful because um, they often offer skills that you won't have learnt as an undergrad or maybe in technical areas that you might not have um, used before, like using Git and GitHub. Yes, there are opportunities and it depends on your program because obviously if you're doing a CDT, you have to do a um, certain number of courses that they prescribe. But in my circumstance, I don't have to take any exams or um, attend many courses really compared to when I was doing undergrad and masters. It feels very different. The final question is how hard is a PhD actually? Um, there is this misconception that PhD students are complete geniuses that no one else can comprehend the intelligence of. I would say this is completely not true. Um, obviously, people who are getting to the PhD level are pretty smart people. These are people who have got good grades at university and have done well there, but they're not going to be complete geniuses. They have worked hard to get to that position. And then about actually during the PhD itself, in my experience, most people feel that they really don't know a lot um, during their PhD. There's a lot of imposter syndrome, but usually PhD work is not something um, that only people who have one big brilliant brainwave can do. Um, PhD work usually just requires putting in a lot of time um, and consistent thought into a problem. And sometimes there's a lot of grunt work as well that um, more senior academics just don't have time for anymore. So you really don't have to be a complete Einstein genius to be able to complete a PhD, uh, at least that's not what I feel. And in those ways, I think a PhD really teaches you um, the skill of perseverance, of keeping going at a problem, um, and especially of independent working and taking the initiative. Um, and I think those are really amazing skills for the future, um, regardless of what you pursue, whether it's continuing in academia or transitioning into an industry job. All right, that's all the questions um, I'm going to answer today. Um, if you have any other questions, I'm happy to film another Q&A video um, if you leave them in the comments below. Um, I'll try to answer some of these in the comments. Um, but thank you for watching. I hope some of that was useful and see you again soon. Bye. I've spent way too long answering this question. Let's move on.